for those that were expecting me to get into the book of Acts, not today, when I get back uh, from Nicaragua and we're headed there soon, we'll maybe get into it then. At the end of Jesus' preaching, what's commonly called the Sermon on the Mount, there's an observation that's made. It has a whole lot to do with how Jesus was perceived during this giant series of sermons. Probably a whole lot more than what Matthew has dictated here in 5, 6, and 7 of his, of his book here. The comment is was this in verse 28 of Matthew 7. And so it was, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not like the scribes, having authority. A little later in his ministry, John records in chapter 12 some comments that Jesus makes. Verse 49, he says, for I have not spoken on my own authority. But the Father who sent me gave me a command. What I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. And therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Interesting things. Now back to Matthew 28, and this is where we'll plant our time in this lesson here. On this occasion, in Matthew 28, in verses 18, 19, and 20, these are some of the last words that Jesus speaks. I know that Acts chapter 1 will make some comments about this, but I perceive that maybe there's an overlap of time there even though our books don't overlap particularly. And this could be the last thing he's telling his apostles. Matthew 8, uh, 28, verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, wait a minute, let's, before we read this, let's think about this moment. He's talking to his apostles after he has spent three years approximately, three, three and a half years, with them. They have left absolutely everything they own to follow him. Some of them were married. You know that Peter was, at least his comments that Peter makes in one of his letters about being a an elder, having a wife, Paul will make about to make a comment about that. And so here he's been with them, focused and dedicated were the disciples this whole time. They were devastated just days previously because of his death and rejoiced even more victoriously than we could ever imagine when he was resurrected. And they're feeling like nothing can defeat us. And they couldn't, not with Jesus being with them. But he's about to leave them. Jesus knows he's about to leave and everything that he has done in teaching and instructing and being an example for them and, and leading the way to what they could follow now culminates in what he's about to say. This is it. And it's the same thing for us. This is who we are and what we're about. As sometimes described by missionaries as our marching orders. Now let's read the passage. All authority, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And very shortly after that, he disappears into a cloud, ascends into heaven. And they're left looking up and pondering these comments. 
And Matthew will include this at the end of his gospel for us to remember forever as Christians, as his disciples. What I'd like to do is dissect the comments that Jesus makes, highlighting some specific words and recognizing these are for us. Number, word, number one, the word authority is mentioned. Jesus says, all authority has been given me. Now, we read already about where that authority came from. It came from God Almighty. Jesus never spoke anything except what God told him. And, and I get the point from what John says. It's just exactly what he intended for him to say. Which behooves us, just as Christians, to realize that whatever we do and whatever we say, it better be just exactly with what the Bible says. Not deviating one way or the other, which we read earlier from Joshua 1. Not turning to the left nor to the right. So important was that, that Jesus himself wouldn't say anything except that. Now, he says, all authority has been given to me. I'm about to tell you something, Jesus says, and I'm telling you it comes from God's authority. The powers on high is about to tell you something. And I've got the authority. You've been following me all these three years. Now here's where it comes down to. Here's where the authority starts. And I'm giving it to you. And you've got to do this. <coughs> authority. When we use that word today. We might use it if somebody's about to, to get into our car. And say, hey, that, that's my car. And what we mean by that is you don't have authority with that. That's mine. Or that's my house. What are you doing in my home? If you found an intruder in there, more likely you're going to run out. But you're wondering, where does he think he gets off doing this? Authority. We fully understand and perceive what that's talking about. In the book of Acts, when Paul is speaking on what's described as Mars Hill, he will make some comments. He'll talk about this God that they didn't really know, but they had an idol nonetheless for an unknown God. And so Paul uses that as a jumping off point to talk about God Almighty, Jehovah God. It says that this God, verse 26 of Acts 17, made from one blood every nation of men. That's what God did. He has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. He knows when you're going to come into this earth. When you're going to go out. And he knows your limits. He did that verse 27. So that we might seek the Lord. And hope that we might grow for him and find him. Though he's not far from each one of us. Verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. You talk about authority. God set this whole world into motion. And everything that we see and all of our existence and everything just hangs in the balances on God. Our existence, our breathing, our heartbeat, all these things that, that we don't even perceive or think about continues functioning because of God. You bet he has all authority. Rightly so. And so when he says to Abraham, like in Genesis 12, leave this land and this country and family and all this and go to this place, later on the book of Hebrews would say in chapter 11 about Abraham, he went out going, not even knowing where he was going, but God said go, and so he went. And then a little later in Abraham's life in chapter 22 of Genesis, once again, God will tell Abraham to go somewhere. But this time, I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, with you. And offer him as a sacrifice. And Abraham didn't balk at that because God has all authority, you see. And he fully understood and comprehended that. And so he didn't balk about when he was to leave his home. Nor even he would offer his own son, his only son. God has authority. He gave him to me. He'll take care of this situation. God provides, Abraham will decide in that chapter, or make a comment at least to his son about that. Been decided already. So now when we go back to Jesus' words, I want you to understand what we're talking about here with this word 
authority because he has authority over your life. Doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, how smart you are, how, how basic you are, or whatever it is. God's smarter, stronger, more powerful, always has been and always will be. And he holds the world in its balances. And you and I included in that. All of the way. Now back to the words of Jesus in Matthew 28. Number one was authority. Second word is go. He still commands to go. I'm not sure just exactly what the looks were on these apostles' faces. With Jesus, everything seemed to be pretty good. But now he says, go into all the world. I want you to go teach the gospel to all nations. We've got more than 12 in here this morning. Could you imagine feeling responsible for getting the gospel ourselves, just us, to every nation? All nations. These 12 didn't feel nearly probably as adequate doctrinally as we might feel for having had the opportunity, us, to have studied completely God's will written in the New Testament. But they do have the edge, yes, I haven't been with Jesus for three years, day in and day out, for the most part. And so they grasped that, what Jesus can do, and had been out on a few limited trips themselves by Jesus' command. But now this is a new one. This is the whole thing. This is the whole ball of wax. And when he disappears, they're standing there looking, thinking, the whole world? I'm telling you, I've got authority. The whole world. Go. The command is still there. Just like it was for Abraham. I want you to go and leave. Or to Moses. I want you to go and talk to Pharaoh. Or to Joshua later. You've got to go in the promised land. He keeps on sending people. And we are a part of that product. The authority's there. Central is a sending congregation. And a going congregation. Just for those that are visiting, I want you to raise your hands if you have left from Central or from the Student Center, that's part of our involvement here, and gone to a foreign field. Raise your hands. Just look around here. I want you to see how many people have gone on the mission fields. It's amazing. It's a sending congregation and a going congregation. I want you to understand that we have to hold fast to that principle. That that's something that is involved in what we do. Now, it's not the only thing, because we read the rest of it, and there's some other things involved. But why do we do that? Well, we can look over in the book of Romans, and we can see what's mentioned in chapter 10. Romans 10, I'll start at verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. <coughs> that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's the starting place of getting you to your salvation. It's not the only point, but it's <coughs> right there. That's what starts you there. You will be saved. Verse 11, for the scripture says that whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. For the same Lord is all, all is rich over all to all who call on him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord. In other words, it doesn't matter where you come from, what land you are. We've got that marching order, all nations. Now it doesn't matter. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then here's this question. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they've not yet heard? And then the next question. Then how shall they hear without 
somebody telling them. Now, I know it says a preacher, but it's not using that like the guy that stands in the pulpit and wears a tie on Sunday morning, but just somebody proclaiming God's word to them. And how shall they preach unless they be sent? That's why we keep doing this. Because somebody's got to hear in order to believe, in order to choose Jesus. So we keep doing that. I like the comments in the book of Joshua. Chapter 14, the Old Testament. We read chapter 1 at the beginning of services here. But let's go back and look at chapter 14 for just a moment. The land was beginning to be divided up among the 12 tribes. They were getting ready to, to really launch out. All these tribes that have been marching around for 40 years in the wilderness are now getting to go into this promised land. And in that bunch are two old timers. And the rest of them are young. The two old timers that 40 years earlier were as part of the group of spies that believed and wanted to go, first of all, in the promised land, when the other ten didn't want to, and they dissuaded the people, and they decided they couldn't make it, and they didn't go. And one by one, all of those old timers died off, except for Joshua and Caleb, who God said they would be preserved and they would cross into that land. And now Joshua is left as the commander after Moses has died and Caleb, his co-buddy, right along with him. And we pick up then in uh, verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word that the Lord had said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. For I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back a word to him that was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brother who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance. And your children's forever. Because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold the Lord has kept me alive. As he said these 45 years. He's not 45. It's 45 more from when he was 40. Okay. So he is what? 85. Ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while I was in Israel. Wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet I am strong this day as on the day when Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war. Both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke on that day. I'm not ready for a rocking chair. I am 85, but I am not stopping yet. I want a mountain. I don't want the flatlands. I want the challenges. Each one of us ought to have that same spirit and that same attitude under the command that God has given us with all authority to go into all the world. Central's ascending congregation. We have two more leaving this Thursday. Most of you are aware that Marvel Tinker and I are headed to Nicaragua. Marvel, if you come on down the front here, I appreciate it. Marvel is our Caleb. Now he's a little bit older than 85. Come on down here. His hearing is a little bit less than normal, but his spirit is still strong and powerful. Thursday, we're let, headed out to Nicaragua. Marvel's 93. His birthday is April the 11th. He'll be 94 then. But he's asking for a mountain. Are you going to send him? Amen? Amen. And we're going to go together and we're going to do what God has commanded us to do. Just as many of us have done. Now, we have a tradition for those that are visiting, understand it. 
we stand in support of people that we send and have a special prayer. And I'm going to ask Chris Willis, our deacon who's in charge of this. Chris, where are you? I know you're here. Okay? Chris has an awesome job. I'm not talking about where he works at Chad State. I'm talking about what he does as a deacon here at Central. And he feels that responsibility, and that's why he's in charge of missions. He looks at that as an important aspect, a very vital aspect of what we do here at Central. And I'm glad that he does that. He does it wholeheartedly. And we're going to ask everybody now to stand as we have a prayer on behalf of Barbara and myself. To God's blessings will be with us and Chris will lead us in that. Father, we uh, hold up before you now these two men who we love and appreciate, and we believe that you do too, Father, for all the work they do in your kingdom. Father, we ask that as they prepare for this trip that you'll be with Brother David. We give you thanks for all of his years of experience and his fluency with Spanish and uh, the time he spent learning the culture and understanding the people and pray father that all those things will work together as he uh, leads this trip and we pray father for his translating and for being with him as he's uh, just preaching to the people and listening to them and uh, planning and coordinating our our trips coming up in may and june uh, some of the activities we'll be doing there and father we especially love our leader Marvel Tinker. We give you thanks, Father, for the experience he has of serving in your kingdom, his experience as a leader, his, his compassionate heart, and his willingness to go on this trip. And we pray, Father, that you'll bless him as he's listening to people and learning about what the church needs in Granada. And, Father, for just the love that he will share with all those people there. Father, we trust you to take care of these men for their safety, for their health. We believe you'll watch over them. We pray, Father, that you'll also be with them on this mission, that they'll be effective, that they'll get the work done they need to do, and that all these things, Father, might be for your glory and for the advancement of your kingdom. We pray that you'll be with their families as they're praying for them here and pray that you'll give them all trust and faith that you'll watch over them. Father, we also pray that we'll be challenged by the example of these men to go and do more for you and your kingdom and to do more than we even think we can do, but to trust in you that you can accomplish great things in us. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be seated. As you have stood with us and prayed, we ask you to stand with us as we leave. We're headed out Thursday. We'll be gone for not even quite a week. An important venture and making some plans for even a bigger process that's yet to come with a larger group. Uh, three different phases that's going on uh, this summer beginning of May 15th. A large group is going down. A lot of the students from the Student Center involved in that. And uh, Craig and Dennis, no, excuse me, Chris and uh, Dennis are headed down. And uh, during that time, they'll be working with a lot of different individuals. And then a segment of that group will return after two weeks' time. And then a short time after that, another segment will come and join those that stayed on. A whole month time down there. It will be a tremendous life-changing experience, but not just for the people that are going. And I know those that have gone think they get more out of it. But having been a missionary and spent uh, time and people coming to see us, you don't know how important it is, the impact that you'll make by your presence. And I want everybody to understand that means the world to those people when we go down there and we say we're backing you we're praying for you 
We are a part of you. And that little church in Granada sees himself as a part of Central. What a blessing we have. Well, there's more to be said about this passage in Matthew 28, but we'll have to cover that at another time. But we are a going congregation, and we keep on going. And you have two of your leaders that stood before you this, this morning asking for your prayers. But as Chris mentioned in his prayer, that are examples for you to be going people. Going across the street and next door to a different dorm or to a house or to a friend. We are a congregation that gets the gospel out there. And may we continue to do it even more than what we've done in the past. Keep your eyes open for doors that open to be going people. The last part of that passage in Matthew 28 it goes and talks about making disciples and then baptizing. That's another part that I would have emphasized if we had time. And then the final part says, and teaching them to observe all things. So we go, we teach. We teach them how to become Christians, how to become disciples. And then we keep on teaching. And that's what we do with one another. To remind ourselves that every one of us is to be held accountable to this God that has all authority to observe all things. Yours and mine. And as we close the lesson out, there's an invitation that's extended each one with a question Are you observing all things? Part of my instruction is to, to teach you to do this and then I ask you, Are you doing it? And if you're not, then come get your life right this morning. Be baptized if you've not done it, come back if you've gone away. But we've got a God of all authority that sends, that directs, that guides, that provides, and demands all things to be observed. Are you right with God? And if not, come on, we stand and say.